husband appearing in court after reportedly confessing. I want my family back. A major developments in the disappearance of that pregnant mother and her two young daughters this morning. Investigators now believe they have found the bodies. The 2,000 page report continues. Christopher gave consent to check the entire house. No one was found in the residence. Christopher did come up to me holding Shanann's wedding ring and stated he found it on the nightstand. When Nicole asked where Shanann's phone was, Christopher went to the couch upstairs and found it between the cushions. He did not know what the password to Shanann's phone was. Nicole knew it possible date of birth of their unborn son and turned it on. Christopher gave consent to look at her phone. No calls were made that morning. I contacted Detective Baumhover and requested he come to the residence. Christopher stated Shanann arrived home from her trip around 2 a.m. He was asleep at the time. He woke up around 5 a.m. to get ready for work and they began talking about them separating. Christopher stated it was a civil conversation and they were not arguing, but they were emotional. Christopher stated they had been talking about separating for a few weeks. Christopher stated he had tools stolen in the past and now he unloads his truck on his Fridays. Christopher stated Shanann was in bed at the time. Christopher stated Shanann told him she was going to a friend's house today with their two children. Christopher stated he did not ask Shanann which of her friend's houses she was going to go to. Christopher stated he went to a job site, oil well, past Hudson, Colorado, to check on it. Christopher stated he was there alone for a few hours. Christopher said he was an operator for Anadarko. Shanann's mother called during this time and was adamant that Christopher had done something and that I needed to check the GPS on his truck. Christopher's work truck has GPS on it. Detective Baumhover and I checked the residence thoroughly. Shanann's purse, wallet, phone, credit cards, etc. were at the residence. We observed nothing suspicious inside the residence. Okay, so now we have a timeline. From this first report taken, Shanann arrives home around 2 a.m. Chris wakes up for work at 5 a.m. and had an emotional conversation about separating with Shanann. Looking back in hindsight, we know these times Chris Watts gave here in his first statement were incorrect. We later learned that Shanann arrived home at 1.48 a.m. and the emotional conversation was supposedly had around 4 a.m. Chris Watts later goes on to say. Also, the neighbor's security camera. We see Chris start his truck up a lot earlier than he originally told the detectives. So let's look at the timeline of Chris Watts' phone that day, August 13th. 2018. The first activity we see on Chris's phone is at 1.48 a.m. The Vivint security alert. At 2.18 a.m. the home's router logs an unspecified activity in Watts's phone. I hope we get answers to what this is further into the report. The next movement is Chris leaving home at 5.48am. 
Chris drove to his first work area of the day. This is estimated 45 minutes away from the Watts family home. The first lot of activity we see on Chris's phone begins at 6.30am. Watts made three unanswered calls to his workmate Roberts. At 6.31am, he then sent his co-worker Roberts a message asking, where are you at? At 6.32am, Roberts replied, saying he was getting fuel in Kersey. Watts called Roberts back, but again got no answer. He then sent Roberts two messages, telling Roberts he was going to survey, then messaging him asking him, where are you going first? At 6.33am, Roberts replied, telling Chris he was going to DPC state. Chris replied with a thumbs up emoji. Looking back at this in hindsight, we can see Chris was making sure no one was going to surprise him by turning up to the work site. From the minute Chris arrived at Survey 319, he made the three unanswered calls to his workmate. Does that mean during the time of these calls and text messages, his daughters were sitting in the back of his truck? still alive. At 6.35am, Roberts messaged Watts and advised him that another workmate, Chad, may be coming out to survey to stroke up the pump. Watts responded asking Roberts to let him know. At 6.39am, Chris tried to call Chad but got no answer. He then sent him a message asking Chad if he was heading out to survey. At 6.41am, he then messaged Chad again about pumping up the 1029. At 6.43 a.m., Chad replied to Watts, Well, since you're out there, you want to fire it up? Have Cody bring his cables. At 6.45 a.m., Watts replied back saying, Okay, I will. Chad replied back saying, I'll head that way in a bit. The next message is at 6.59 a.m. So it's been 15 minutes since the last activity on Watts' phone. From the time he arrived on site, he has been calling and text messaging his co-workers to make sure absolutely no one was going to turn up on site at Survey 319. This has been the first noticeable gap from the activity on Watts' phone. At 6.59 a.m., he received a message from his co-worker, Roberts. Roberts told Watts, I guess I'm headed out that way to start up the 1029, and Chad will be meeting out there. At 6.59 a.m., Watts replied, OK. So, Watts has been warned that his workmates will need to be heading out his way soon, but not right away. The next activity from Watts is at 7.43 a.m. This has now given Watts a 45-minute window. At 7.43 a.m., Watts takes a picture of a leak around a pipe. He then called his co-worker Luke and held a 1 minute 45 second conversation. Roberts messaged Watts and asked, how's it look? Watts replied, fresh. LOL. Looking back in hindsight, that reply from Chris just minutes after burying his wife and disposing of his children in the tanks is rather disturbing. At 7.47am, McNeil called Watts and held a two-minute conversation. At 7.51am, Roberts asked, is it a lot? And Watts replied with the picture of the oil leak by the pipe. At 7.55 a.m., Roberts asked, want me to bring some gator? We can try and pressure test the line too if you want. At 7.55 a.m., Watts replied, I got it handled. Thanks though. So there's no more activity until 8.25 a.m. That gives Chris a 30-minute window. At 8.25 a.m., Chris made a 23-second call to Shanann's phone. At 8.26 a.m., Chris googled up the school his daughters were enrolled to start, then called the school to inform them his girls will no longer be starting school there. The next activity on Watts' phone isn't until 9.05. That gives Chris a 34-minute window. At 9.05, Chris calls the realtor, 
about selling his house. The next lot of activity isn't until 10.10am, this being the longest gap, giving Chris Watts a one hour, five minute long window. At 10.10am, Chris googles the lyrics for the song Battery by Metallica. At 10.28am, Shanann's mum Sandy messaged Chris and asked Chris, is Shanann okay? Chris called Sandy's phone and Sandy called him back. So this is the first time we start seeing family and friends worry if Shanann is okay. You would think this would have made Chris panic, especially at being Shanann's mother, but no. From 10.33 to 10.41am, Chris searched the internet for hotels in Aspen. At 10.42am, he then called the Western Snowmass Resort. At 10.44am, Shanann's mother called Chris. At 10.45am, Chris googled up Groupons. At 10.51am, Chris called Shanann's mum back. There is no more activity on Chris's phone until 12.15pm, giving Chris a 1 hour 25 minute window. At 12.15pm, Chris's co-worker Josh messages asking Chris if he's heard from Shanann today, telling Chris Cassie and Nikki are worried they can't get hold of Shanann. At 12.16pm, Watts took two photos of sunflowers in an open prairie. At 12.17pm, Watts received an alert from his Vivint panel. We now know this is the time Nicole Atkinson was at the house and the doorbell camera picked up Nicole so Chris could see exactly what was going on at his house. At 12.18pm, Watts called Nicole Atkinson. At 12.21pm, Watts messaged Josh and told him he talked to Nikki. Shanann went to a friend's house with the kids today. I haven't heard from her since. I will keep you updated though. At 12.21pm, Josh replied, the girls were worried. So, as you can see here from this timeline, that by lunchtime, Shanann's family and friends were very worried about her. At 12.27pm, Chris called Nicole Atkinson again. At 12.27pm, the realtor messaged asking Chris if he finished the basement or do any other upgrades to the house. At 12.31pm, Shanann's friend Addie messaged Chris asking if Shanann was okay. It's not like her not to respond to us. We haven't heard from her all day. At 12.41pm, Chris called Nicole Atkinson. At 12.43pm, Shanann's friend Cassie messaged Watts. Shanann is in a very bad way emotionally and I'm worried about her. I know you are having issues, but I don't know to what extent. But I do know I have never seen her so broken to an extent I am worried. At 12.44pm, Watts replied back saying, Shanann went to a friend's house with the kids and won't tell where. At 12.46pm, Cassie replied to Chris, telling him that nobody else except her and Nikki know about the separation, and if Shanann isn't with herself or Nikki, then where could she possibly be? Cassie went on to say, Shanann's car and shoes and everything are at the house. At 12.48pm, Watts responded, I told Nikki about it so she wouldn't freak out anymore at the house. I think Christina knows as well. We talked last night and I told her I wanted to sell the house, get something smaller, separation would be best right now. I really don't want you to think I'm a bad person, Cassie. I mean, that's just a real fucked up thing to say and a major red flag. At 12.49pm, Cassie replied, Right now, I don't care about you or your relationship or what type of person you are or not. 
or what I think of you. At 12.50pm, Watts responded to the realtor, telling her the basement is still unfinished and no other upgrades. At 1.03pm, Cassie replied to Watts saying her only concern was for Shanann's well-being. She told Chris, Nikki is calling the police telling Chris that Shanann is broken emotionally and her blood sugar levels had dropped. They were worried that she may be passed out in the house. So unless you want the police to bust your door down, you better get home now and check on your family. At 1.03pm, the realtor replied, suggesting a house at 6508 Saratoga. At 1.05pm, Watts told Cassie, I'm going home, Cassie. On my way. Don't call the police. I will be there in 45 minutes. At 1.06pm, Cassie thanked him and explained her fears. Nikki and I know what state Shanann was in all weekend and we want to see she isn't in the house because this is seriously a concern. At 1.07pm, Watts called Cassie and held a one-minute conversation. At 1.13pm, Watts workmate Troy asked Watts if everything was okay and if he needed anything to let him know. 1.14pm, the realtor asked Watts if he preferred a three-car garage. Watts replied, three-car garage. I will drive by 6508 address when I get home. I find the realtor to be rather annoying. I mean, what part of downgrading a big house is a three-garage home on the same street? Chris's phone goes silent for about 25 minutes. Nikki Atkinson calls Chris. And again at 1.59pm. At 2.10pm, Shanann's friend Christine messaged Chris and asked, What is going on? Where are you? We are so worried. At 2.11pm, Chris messaged Shanann's phone, asking Shanann, where are you? So literally seconds later, we see Chris Watts pull up to his house on the body cam. When I look at the timeline activity of Watts' phone, I notice the activity from the time he arrives at survey is non-stop on his phone. 6.31 until around 6.45 a.m. We then see a 15-minute gap in any phone activity. Then at 6.59 a.m., Watts gives a short reply saying, OK. Then no activity until 7.43 a.m. That gives Chris a one-hour gap from 6.45 till 7.43 a.m. I feel this would be the time of death for Bella and Cece. Chris Watts starts to text a lot from 7.43 a.m. on. I personally feel like the tone of Chris's messages and replies seem to be a lot different after that one-hour gap. Even calling Shanann's phone, the children's school, and the realtor, all by 9am. Then what started googling things like the hotel in Aspen and the music lyrics, like he had no worries in the world at that time. Let me know in the comments below what time gaps you find fitting for what Chris Watts has done. Looking back in hindsight, what would Chris Watts have done if any of his workmates had have been on their way to survey 319? And is that possibly the reason Watts put the gas can in the back of his truck that morning? Was he prepared to blow up the survey in order not to be caught if he ran out of time during his plan? 